Good evening. Um, I'm Susan Tissot, the Executive Director of the King's History Museum, so I want to welcome you to the museum. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Roberta Hall, who's Emeritus Faculty from OSU. Woo! <laughs> That's right. And someone who's really important in my life because she kept me on track. I'm a two-time reader and was one of Bobby's undergraduates and graduate students. And, um, who was very overzealous, maybe, and had a lot of energy, and, and she kept saying, focus, focus. Um, and I did, so it did pay off. Uh, but uh, Roberta Hall is going to be speaking on portraits of the Coquille people. Coquille. Coquille, thank you. Um, <laughs> Roberta Hall was born in 1939 in Indiana, completed a doctorate at the University of Oregon in 1970, then moved to Vancouver Island to teach at the University of Victoria, where she began to learn about the Pacific Coast many cultural traditions. Her family returned to Oregon in 1974. In 1976, Coquille members invited Oregon State University anthropologists to help them salvage an eroding archaeological site near the Coquille River. This project grew over the years to involve more Coquilles and community volunteers who did oral histories and gathered information from museums, archives, and archaeology. Dr. Hall retired from the OSU faculty in 2003. Her other anthropological work is in human evolution and past to present human health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roberta Hall.
found that although some people in the community thought the coke wells were gone, uh, I didn't find that to be the case. And I found that they had a past and a present and a future. And so that was the emphasis that we wanted to, to give it. Um, Cokewell families, well, maybe that's pretty obvious. That's sort of the heart of the tribe. And <clears throat> telling stories and legends. Well, it seemed to me that those are what have kept the past alive uh, for many people that I knew. Uh, the legends, some may be mythical, or they might tell lessons about the environment and the animals and the plants. Uh, folklorists tell us that if legends and stories are brought uh, from one area into a different um, kind of geographic and natural history area, the stories may stay the same in their basic content, but they incorporate new features, new parts of the environment, and so forth. And we seem to have found that to be the case here. <clears throat> Remembering um, elders and what's past, uh, many of the Coco stories are connected to the people who told them. Uh, and so the memories of stories may be related to, for instance, um, Aunt Nell uh, Wasson and Aunt Daisy Wasson were, were two who I remember enjoyed telling them. Uh, that the people that I knew told me about hearing from them, but people like Tony Tanner and uh, uh, Wilfred Ron Wasson and Susan Waldemar and others uh, were the tellers who had benefited from the earlier generation. A celebration and restoration. Well, celebrations, of course, help people remember their traditions. And these include memories of past events and those who were involved. And this is Beverly Ward. Some of you knew her. And the picture is made in 1978, that's what that means. She wrote the book, White Moccasins. The book's origins date to Beverly's life with Susan Ned, um, Beverly's husband, Jean Meekham's grandmother, on Susan Ned's allotment, which was north of Bandon. And Beverly, um, obviously, is very important in this, in this story. Um, because she had that experience and, and wrote about it, and let's see what we can read. and Susan Ned were full-blooded Indians. They lived on cut rate for many years. Now they are gone, and their old lot is covered with brush. In 1936, a fire swept the southern Oregon coast, and of course, an Irishman brought here fed the flames. The little town abandoned some six miles to the south was almost demolished and everything on the net place burned to the ground. The little cabin where Jean Meek and my young husband and I live is gone without a trace. But a few pieces of twisted metal still mark the spot where his grandmother's house stood. The old road that led down to Cut Creek was gone. They still live on in my memory. On the north bank, a bed of golden daffodils shows where the nets lived when they first came to Cut Creek. Grandma and Ned and some of her family are sleeping on the hill above and the history of the forgotten people is buried in this land. Susan Ned was a Coquille Indian and couldn't read or write, but she knew the forest and she was steeped in history. She told me about the people and the giants that lived in this land, the great tribal waves and things that happened before the white man's time. Now she and her people were driven to reservations, a broken trees and heartbreak. Grandma and Ned had a big two-story house. The walls weren't finished, the floors were bare, and most of the furniture was handmade. The table and the bench and the heating stove were at one end. A chair or two and a few boxes were used for seats. And grandmother had a special rocking chair. And grandmother laid beside her weaving and performed her usual evening ritual. She filled her pipe with kenny paint leaves and tamped them down with a leather finger. Then she settled down in her rocking chair and smoked a pipe. 
Backed up soccer there in an old wrinkled place, bronze blood smoke from many campfires. When no strangers were around, grandmother liked to reminisce. Sometimes she sat for hours and she talked about grandfather Ned and her childhood and her people. We forgot the storms that beat around outside and the wind blew through the cracks and the lamp flickered. Sometimes I felt like I was back in time and I could hear the wind sowing through the ancient forest. Her people became so real it seemed that they were there in the moving shadows on the walls and bit by bit I pieced their story together. She was reading from, from her book. Uh, <coughs> later in life, um, Beverly became a member of a writing uh, group that in Cottage Grove and she began with research so she could uh, write a book like this. She did some other writing too. She's a good example of a person who married into a Coco family, the Knit family. Uh, she and others like her helped with work that resulted in restoration. Uh, there were meetings to host, potlucks to prepare for, networking across the community, Every family had people like Beverly who helped their families do the tasks that uh, were needed uh, for restoration. I should say something about, um, this is 79 uh, when this was made. And in those days, um, people in the tribe did use the term coquille. That was the customary one and it was for the river. And then uh, as research went on, um, other uh, pronunciations became and, and lots of arguments about what the, the real uh, word was and it may have been something like Skokwa uh, and very difficult for English speakers to pronounce but Skokwa is uh, one of the traditional uh, pronunciations so sometimes we uh, forget which, which era we're speaking from. Um, I, I should say something about allotments too. Uh, the land parcels, most of you know what they are. Uh, Susan Ned had one, and it, I think it was later referred to as Eddie Ned's allotment. Um, the Dawes Act in, I think it was 1887, um, provided for Native people to, to get these parcels, 160 acre pieces, I think. Um, and in a lot of places, they were carved out of reservations and they stole, really, from, from reservations and from uh, tribes with reservations. But on the South Coast, there were no red, uh, reservations, and so public land was used instead. And, and uh, Susan Ned and Susan Wasson both, both had them, and uh, they weren't the only ones, but they were very, very important for their families. and, and uh, as long as they lasted, the allotments lasted. Um, many of you are familiar with that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's keep me on track here. Um, everybody <coughs> knows um, Jerry Running Fox, I think. I just um, um, noticed a really big picture of him. I was staying at the hotel. <laughs> And his name is uh, very prominent on it, so anybody looking at it would, would recognize him. Um, he was uh, Beverly Ward's son, and so he was um, in the Ned family lineage. And this picture was made in 1978. In 1976, it was Jerry who invited our team from Oregon State to salvage an archeological site that was washing out on the banks of the Hill River, and uh, it was in danger of being vandalized, and actually had been a little bit, and uh, so it needed to be saved. <clears throat> the very first people um, of the Kokwal tribe I met uh, were members of the Ned family. Um, Jerry Running Fox was the person who called us and asked for help in the salvage and it was September of 1976 in good weather. The site was being eroded. I gathered several archaeology students 
And my daughter Nancy and I went to the site, um, which is very near uh, Bullard's Beach State Park, adjacent to it. Um, and so we camped at, at the park itself. And we met Jerry, his wife Jean, his mother Beverly Ward, his daughter JJ, his niece Sharon Parrish, and Matt Parrish, her son, and probably some other Cookwells as well. As soon as I met Beverly, she began telling me about Susan and Charlie Nen. She just kept telling the stories as we were doing our work. She was just had a pen up in her and they had to come out. So we had a very successful salvage over the next couple of days and we planned to do more work. So we arranged to get together again and we met in Pooh's Bay. At one of the first tribal meetings, I met Bud Chase. And at that time, he was the chair of the Coquel tribe. Uh, the Coquels, along with other natives of the coast, and some other parts of the state and some other states as well, the Oregon was particularly hard hit, had been terminated in the 1950s. I bet everybody here knows what that means. Is that true? You all know? pretty much what termination means, the special relationship uh, between a people and the federal government is terminated, ended. <coughs> and usually a cash, small cash settlement was made to persons who were listed on the federal rolls of that particular tribe. That happened in the 1950s when it seemed to the native people there was no alternative but to sign the papers. Um, but now, it was 1976, and at that time, um, restoration was on the minds of many tribes. Um, descendants were organizing for that work. In 1976, a lot of work had already been done to restore the Confederated Tribes of Selects. And uh, they were restored officially in the next year, 1977. And that was the very first Oregon tribe to be restored. At the meetings in Coos Bay, besides Bud Chase, I met Bud's wife, Doris, and Bud's mother, Elena Wilman, and her very good friend, Midge Wasson Garrett. I didn't know it at the time, but with just this many people, I met members of three strong families which can be traced back to pre-reservation times with kinship charts, families that many present-day Cumpwell people are related to. The Ned family is the family of Jerry Running Fox. The Hanson Saki Chase family is Bud's family. And the Wasson family is the family of uh, Susan Wasson and her descendants. Um, this is a picture of Elena Wilkin, Bud's um, mother of the Hanson um, Sankey Chase family. And this is <coughs> Lawson Garrett. Um, later, we also met, let's, let's jump around on its own. Um, what can you say? <coughs> um, we met uh, members of the Joe Thomas family, descended from Jack Thomas and uh, some Coos and Coquel people. I wish I had stories and photos of all the people who are part of the Coquel network, but I don't. This is one of the limitations um, for which I apologize. Um, like other Coquel families, Midge's family and the Thomas family had Coos uh, ancestors Two. Uh, though the ancient village is now considered to be ancestral Coquel villages, they include lots along the Coquille River, along the coast, and in the South Slough area of Coos Bay. But many families have ancestors who live, native ancestors who live farther north or south. Um, the ancient Coquels and other coastal people probably thought of themselves more like members of villages or rather than larger political units. 
The tribes we now think of as political units were in part invented by the federal government so it could legitimize the cession of land so it could find people who were leaders in these villages to sign off on the cession of land, in my opinion. Um, but both systems, both the federal and the, the local, the native, um, probably would agree that kinship networks are the heart of, of the tribes in any case. And so um, in, in this picture here, um, we have Joyce Tanner, the left, and then uh, one of our volunteers, Allison Otis, and then Bud Chase and Doris Chase, and they're developing a kinship chart um, in, in, at the 1978 project. Um, we used a roll of shelf paper, and the tribal members would provide the information about mother, father, and children, and so forth, each individual, and filled in some of the blanks um, as different people looked at the chart. Over the years, the Coquels have expanded these networks and added a whole lot of, of people, both um, from today and yesterday. Uh, I want to briefly discuss the 1978 project. After the 1976 work, we had a number of potluck type meetings in Coos Bay, usually at the neighborhood facility building. Um, we were looking for ways to finance oral, more oral history research. And as the tribe was not federally recognized, that was talking about now 1976 and 77 when these conversations were going on, it wasn't easy to find a, a grant. Well, it's never easy to find a grant. Anybody can tell you that regardless. But that made it difficult. But we finally did obtain a grant to do a oral history project. And that provided for uh, three weeks uh, in September of 1978. And it started just about this time of year, just before Labor Day. Bud Chase had given us a list of individuals on the final roles tribal roles that had been made up in the 1950s. And we tried to locate the people on it. We had a team of volunteers who came from across the country. It was part of the grant. It was a, a good part because they were really energized. And we were able to visit with and have potlucks with a large number of people. The original goal, the Cocos told us they wanted to have was a better understanding of the life ways of their ancestors who lived before the time that the outsiders came and then the reservations were created. Um, so this was before the early 1800s. We wanted to go back to that era, if we could, and definitely before the mid-1800s gold rush. Because the gold rush was followed by conflicts um, that led to the removal of many Native people from their homelands. Now, when that removal happened, some, particularly women, were able to stay in the home area by marrying newcomers, many from Europe or Canada or far away on the other side of the continent. Um, but others who left were able to return several years later after the conflicts ended and the army didn't care. The 1978 field project consisted of lots of conversations about long ago times and about real histories of people of the last hundred years. And we did this with potlucks and get togethers. And when I showed some of these pictures to my friend, she said, looks like you're having a party. And we kind of were all the time. Uh, they were great occasions. This photo of Wilfred Wasson was made in 1978 for our history project. Um, I wish I had more pictures of Wilfred, but um, this is the best one that shows his face rather than some other activities that you'll see in a few minutes when you mostly see his back or shoveling. Um, ashes on a uh, salmon bake or something like that. 
Um, but anyway, um, we talked a lot about legends and tales, and as a follow-up, uh, Allison Otis, uh, Joanne King, and I returned in 1979 to make uh, audio tapes of some of the things that people wanted recorded. Um, now, Wilfred warned us that according to traditional rules, coyote stories could be told only during the winter. Other stories and reminiscences could be told in the summer. Um, I was very inexperienced in using recording equipment, and in 1979, the equipment was not nearly as user-friendly as it is today. In any case, uh, our team went and arranged with us Southwest Oregon Community College to use um, a room that had was supposed to be pretty much soundproof or not, not gather sound from the outside. And, um, and so we used that and I think we camped at one of the, um, one of the state parks. Um, I made copies of what we were able to uh, record for a few tribal members. There was no tribal office at that time. And I gave copies to SWAP and to some local libraries. I kept the original tapes, but did not listen to them again or work with them until about 2012. Uh, by that time, technology had changed a lot. Fortunately, Oregon State University still had some old equipment uh, that could play these old reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and I asked <coughs> them to digitize them to put them so I, they could be used in a computer. Uh, I've been doing audio recording for radio and editing audio on the computer, so I had some familiarity by that time and decided to use that to make something more for the tribe. I found the tapes hadn't totally deteriorated, though they had deteriorated some, and made edited versions of usable parts. And those are those few small bits um, that I have here to give you a sense of the individuals that were drawing portraits of. And to me, the sound of the people speaking conveys as much or more than the words. And, uh, in, in this one, uh, Wilfred um, was asked to tell a story he told before about grizzly bear and, um, and black bear. So let's listen to what what he says. No, let's not go that way. Get it to come up. Come on. No, no, I gotta do it. Come on, you Wilfred. <laughs> he, he, he is a guy, you know. You had to sometimes coax him. <laughs> But you know, well, that's where it is, yeah. But you know, there must have been grizzly bears living all the time. Because they had a, they had a name for a grizzly bear, they had a name for a uh, black bear. But uh, black bear and grizzly bear were living in and they both had children.
hosted many of our visits in 1978 and in uh, subsequent projects. We were there in 1980 with another um, project in September, continuing the oral histories and developing uh, information about um, the allotments and uh, the kinship networks. Uh, their families made our social gatherings informative and our informative gatherings social. Great fun. And Tony Ann Brin, uh, with Tony Tanner. Sometimes we call them Little Tony and Big Tony. Sometimes Tony Ann. Uh, but that's also 1978. And about Tony Tanner as a storyteller, as many of you know, he, he was. Um, he became fairly blind. In fact, he lost one eye in a, you might say it was a logging accident, but it was a little worse than that, as I understand it. A, a truck carrying loggers uh, was going down a hill and lost control of the brakes, and the driver abandoned. Several people died. Um, Tony lost an eye. Um, and as his eyesight sometimes dimmed in later years, but I would, we would see him at a, an event like a, uh, salmon bake or something. He would hear my voice and he'd come over and say, that you, Bobby? I got another story for you. <laughs> and he would have another, this would be a real story. And I wish I had uh, written them all down. Well, this is, this is a story about real people, the uh, little one here. In this recording, he tells a story about deer hunting on the Lotmans. In, in some of the stories, and there's some from the dead property, for instance, really sad ones, the natives lost their deer or were charged with a crime. Um, but in this one, the Coquel hunter, who was an uncle of Tony's wife, Joyce, uh, won the day. And he was, this is a well-known story that uh, Tony was asked to tell. with 
restoration. And in this, in this particular conversation, um, they were asked if they knew George Wasson. And um, I gotta explain about the George Wassons. There are at least three George Wassons in the stories. The first uh, George Wasson uh, was a Canadian who left his home in Eastern Canada and worked in San Francisco and then on the Oregon coast. He married an upper football woman named Adulsa, who became known as Susan Wasson. She was a widow of George's business partner. The first uh, George Wasson, that George Wasson from Canada, uh, he had a son named George, who in the 1900s went to Washington to lobby on behalf of Native land rights. And Wilfred and his uh, younger brother George, um, the third, and that's the third George in the story, were among five of his children. We'll get to that George soon. But in this excerpt from conversations with Elena and Midge, they were asked if they knew George Wasson, and this is the middle George Wasson, who was born in 1880, is the one that they're referring to. So before the tape begins, Elena and Midge were asked if they knew George. And you'll hear Elena mainly, but Midge's voice, which is deeper and softer, comes in as well. Oh, we know you real well when you're since you were a kid, probably, or I was. I don't know, how many years was he there? George was in Washington Pike, 2022. Yeah. 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 My folks contributed several hundred dollars, bought clothes and everything. But everyone was in favor, you know, of him going. Yeah, and then, you know, he didn't have any money. And, well, I don't know, he do his own washing and everything, you know, he had buy the best and the cheapest way he could. And it was, really was a, quite a task, I'm telling you. And there was no one that had any money. You know, the Indians here didn't have any money. Not that they were, they could send him any great amount to help him. This is interesting because it shows that the, to me, it shows that the various families were working together um, for this goal uh, to, to get some of the land back and to um, force the federal government or entice the federal government to be more fair with them. And so they were, they were working on that by helping uh, George, who was at that time a bachelor, he married uh, later in life. Um, to get by, and uh, he stayed, uh, according to Wilfred, he often stayed, and uh, Indians often stayed at the Harrington Hotel in Washington, D.C., and as a result, uh, or partly as a result, that was Wilfred's choice for the group that went back to Washington in uh, 1988, stayed at the Harrington Hotel. Uh, no air conditioning um, and a lot of other uh, things. It had a nice cafeteria, very nice cafeteria on the first floor, which probably was air conditioned, but above that, no way. <laughs> so we were we were following in a, in a tradition that was set um, only by Indian people from all over the country in the state of Harrington in the early days. Okay, so that's. Let's see that. And, um, so um, what we were talking about so far was kind of in the late um, 70s and during the early 1980s, Coco families continued to meet and develop allies for restoration. In 1986, a series of archaeological projects began in Bandon. Along First Street, construction had uncovered evidence, more evidence, of the early village site that had been identified a decade before. And this led to cooperative work between the tribe, the port of Bandon, the city of Bandon, the Bandon Historical Society, and the uh, Oregon State team. They included the students, and also there were local volunteers as well. And 1988 was an especially uh, production <coughs> um, so that was a very uh, a big year that in a way it started out with 
uh, an excavation, I think it's about the 1st of July, uh, in downtown Bandon, coming back to the sites that had been uh, disturbed and, and worked on in, in 86 to do a more complete job. Um, but it, it started out as tribal members from different families and generations worked together to start a fire the night before the salmon bait. There's a salmon bait and then an archaeological project going on at the same time. About a thousand people came to celebrate with the tribe at one of its ancestral villages. I have a few pictures from that. And this one shows a gopher there with Matt Parrish and Ron Parrish um, building the fire along First Street in, in Bandon uh, the day before. This is the day before the, the big salmon bait. And then later that night, they were still working, Wilfred Lawson and George Lawson were tending the fire during the evening. Now, George, I'm not sure when I met him, uh, when we did our 78 project, he had been in Nepal. He had gone there to uh, try to learn more about how indigenous people lived. He was particularly interested in uh, the Tibetans who had fled from um, Tibet, which uh, China kind of pushed them out into Nepal. And um, so we met, didn't meet him that way. And, and the villagers, George was a little suspicious of us because we were from OSU, and of course he was a longtime employee uh, at the University of Oregon. <laughs> and, uh, but later, um, just as a side sideline, I became very friendly with George. I went uh, for work. I needed to go to Nepal for two months, and uh, George called me aside and wanted me to see all his slides, and, and actually asked me to take some money to a Tibetan friend of his, and I did. It, I don't know that anybody cared, but anyway, it was. Uh, uh, we became pretty good friends over Nepal. And then we're able to talk more about the uh, Oak Wells too. Okay, so let's see. The next day then, this is the night before, and at the Salmon Bay, um, there are, were some notable people, namely, uh, particularly Senator Hatfield, who was well known for helping many tribes uh, be restored or, or have uh, who were facing other difficulties with the federal government. He came to our Sam Bay, and there George and Wilfred are speaking with him. And here we have Jerry Lundinbox and Linda Poster. I don't know if it was at that Sam Bay or another one, but anyway, there they are. These are right here in this room, one. Um, uh, here, Tony Tanner, Sharon Harris, and George Watson are part of an entry procession at a Salmon Bay. There were quite a few in different years at that same area. While a thousand people came to eat salmon, the OSU team opened archaeological units and onlookers watched. Uh, it was um, a one of a, a very typical day on the coast. It started out foggy, and then, as they say, the fog burned off, and it was a lovely day. And I think we were there for 10 days. And that day, uh, the Coquels returned to an age old ritual of blessing the salmon, returning bones of the salmon to the river. And George Lawson in the red kerchief at the right uh, led, led this ceremony. And I don't know whether it was spontaneous or whether um, George had planned it or Wilfred had planned it or Jerry Running Fox had planned it or I, I have no idea. But it was beautiful and as you can see and you probably recognize a lot of a lot of people. From the right there's Wilfred laughing of course and I think um, Michelle Burnett and I think it is Michelle and uh, George and Anne Lemon and Jimmy Metcalf, who was a 
tribal a chair of the tribal council at one time, and Sharon is smiling, and Tony is <laughs> uh, talking, I think, to a granddaughter, I'm not sure, and Reg Pollen, his son are there, and Sidney Richards, and probably some other people that, that you know that I, that I don't know. Um, but it was a very happy and, um, uh, and yet a traditional and kind of a spiritual um, ceremony as well, it just, just developed. And Don, my husband, got the picture. <clears throat> Also in 1970, 1988, uh, later that season, this was very hot, uh, that was the, a week that the tribe, 10 people, uh, went to Washington, D.C. to lobby and have a hearing on behalf of restoration. And there in the, in the front, um, we have um, Wilfred, Roy Yoki, Linda Proctor, Michelle Burnett, and uh, Joe Thomas, Sharon Parrish, and Sydney Richards, um, and Matt and Jesse are in the back, and another person as well who I just met tonight. So there were 10 tribal members, uh, Michael Mason, the attorney, <laughs> and myself. Uh, there was a break in hearing when a congressperson has to go vote, hearings stop, and that happened during this hearing, and so I had my camera and was able to make that picture. Um, in the 1980s, uh, Jerry Running Fox enjoyed excavating and screening for artifacts. He really got the bug. Uh, he liked to converse with students and volunteers, and often teasing and using his own brand of humor, along with stories of Coco history. Some are fantastic stories, uh, and were pretty clearly so to a volunteer who listened to the first of it. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, oh. you know, one of those, that, that the tall tale part of it uh, starts about halfway through. But um, something Jerry enjoyed, and he also um, was a, a supervisor or a tribal representative at a lot of other tribal uh, excavations, not just the Coquel, because when the um, Bureau of Land Management archaeologists and others found he was willing and capable and didn't mind working uh, as well, um, he, he was invited. So here he, he's uh, in band and, and asked uh, some questions. You don't hear the questions, but you can figure out what they are. Starts out with excavation. Curtis Woodward. <laughs> well, this, this dig here, I'm the tribal supervisor on the dig, and I'm also chairman of the cultural committee to gain as much information as I can from all of our digs and everything we can find. And as far as this area right in here, we have a great concern for this item anyway, because my great grandmother was born just, this is about 10 blocks from here, and my great grandfather was born over by Bullards. So we knew that this was our village just in here. So that's one of the reasons why I have a big interest in this dig, just to, uh, see what the lifestyle is in and see how far back we can go in our history. Because I know from what my grandmother's told me that there must have been uh, Coquille Indians here back three to 4,000 years. And actually it was uh, Nesoma Indians. And that meant the people of the big water. So one, one band of this lower Coquille group was up which is just like Prosper, and they were called the people of the Big Bend. That's what my biggest interest in is just to find out how far back we can go with our people here in this area, how long we have been here. I feel that my grandmother was right, a lot of things were fine, and she had said that they have agreed on now, that according to village sites and work areas and everything. So that's my biggest interest. 
Uh, yes, my niece, she's the secretary of the tribe. She was here and uh, her son and his girlfriend and her brother. And they've been taking a big interest in this. And I'm glad to see that they are taking interest because so many of them, they're just letting it slide by. And I feel like they're taking interest, they'll know more about what our people are like thousands of years ago or even hundreds of years ago. And this is um, Jerry Screen for Artifacts with a, a volunteer. It was something he particularly enjoyed doing. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, many of you have seen this plaque at the abandoned site in Summer Village. Uh, I call it the, think about it as the real Old Town abandoned site. Many of you will remember this, of course. 2014, uh, the 25 year restoration ceremony, and that's 25 years from uh, 1989, because though we had the hearing in 1988, the Congress didn't act on the bill for restoration until the following year, so it acted on it in 1989, and then the 25 years, 2014. So, um, Thank you all for your attention and comments, questions, corrections, please, because there probably are some, uh, and additions. Well, additions we could go on all night. We probably don't think we should do that. Uh, but thank you very much. were 
um, being understood, which started what about 1987, I think, and these were discovered in 1990. 1990. And when we knew that there had been a number of subduction earthquakes right there um, and along the Copewell and Coquille River and the whole coast, obviously, uh, from Northern California through to uh, central Vancouver Island. Um, anyway, so what, what we pieced together was that they were more like outdoor uh, fire <coughs> or cooking areas, not, not indoor ceramics or things that you carry with you, um, but, but definitely useful products that were um, unstable and that in a, in a strong, bad winter would probably be broken up and not recognizable. People had found chunks of stuff in sites before that didn't seem to have any purpose. Uh, and, and so what we finally thought was that probably these had been preserved uh, by a tsunami, basically, uh, that, that spread sand over them and covered them. And it was thought, and people speculate about this, but that uh, when uh, fine basketry for cooking, that technology came in, it was, you know, lightweight, beautiful baskets. People could um, heat stones and boil water in them and carry them and, and so forth, that it kind of replaced the uh, other technology. But, that part of it, we don't know the answers, but that was probably more surprising. Otherwise, a lot of stone tools and tools made of bone, of course, and shell, and, and some really pretty things like that. Where is it now? Um, I think one is still. Uh, They're both across the street on display with the administration office. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were burials um, at that site as well. Um, let's see. Um, I think people generally believe that um, people were buried around the edge of a hole. You, know, you, you dig out, they call them semi-subterranean houses, meaning daylight basement. I mean, we would call it daylight basement, right? Um, so you dig out, put the meter down, and, and, um, and you have, you know, uh, material all around the home, and, um, they're very rich, and sometimes people were buried in those, but, um, there also was speculation that, um, some of the massacres were involved in some of the burials that had been uh, unintentionally uh, disturbed, particularly more on the Bullard, Bullard uh, State Park area, which is a little bit upriver and on the up opposite bank. So yeah, there were lots of course, fauna material, elk, seals, sea lions, fishes, um, as you all know, I guess uh, the shell middens are wonderful for preserving information because the coastal soils tend to be very acidic, and when you put the shell in it, then it makes acidic soils um, slightly alkaline, and it preserves bone. And so a lot of what ecologists know about um, the animal life is because of the name middens. And uh, we've been involved with the um, study of uh, sea otters, for example, that used to be on the coast. And because we have a lot of sea otter bones and they're well preserved in the shelter. So lots of, lots of long stories there. Uh, the book that uh, 
that we edited um, people of the Tokyo, what's the, what's the best word? Estuary, right? <laughs> I forget the names, um, as um, some summary of, of excavations, as well as other history. Any other questions, any other comments, any other suggestions about um, the studies on the fortunes of the people of this transition era, which I, I think is a wonderful era? Uh, did you come to any conclusions about how long this area had been populated by the Native We think, um, hmm, I think, 6,000 years for, I believe, if I'm remembering right, uh, what the Shonovers think is about 6,000 years is kind of as far back as the coastline is more or less stable. But before that, the coastline is way out to sea because the coast was rising all that time. And I think it's generally believed that with the right sites, even along the coast, you could go 6,000, but in some places, you know, where there's uplift or where special geological things happen, like at Kakinich Lake and then down at, um, in the Brookings area, the big park, um, is that Morgan State Park? Um, there are special circumstances that and have allowed people to go farther, so, Probably, um, possibly as long as 15,000 years ago, but it's somewhat speculated on the far end, I'm afraid. I mean, there's a good reason, but no hard to get kind of in between there. You might mention that you're going to have a boat off the shore out here someplace looking at sites that were, would have been in that area. Um, yeah, it happened here. Boys, boys. Yeah, there's a, one of my colleagues, and some of you know, Lauren Davis is working on the, with Noah, looking for evidence of sites at a kind of uplifted area and then the head. But that's a new project. <laughs> so who knows how far all of these will go. But many people feel it's a very long time. And of course, Grove produced to tell us um, well, well, but first the natives, the Homo sapiens, they started here. And then we populated the rest of the world. <laughs> and, uh, and came back. But, uh, and then, but then we said, well, so the people that came back, they're returning. They have some rights then. He said, oh no. <laughs> but um, we, we always had a good time. Um, talking with both Wilfred and, and Jerry in particular, and uh, always in good humor because we're all working for the same cause. I miss those guys. I think we, I think we got it. Thank you. 
all being here as well. And to our young people that are here today, thank you for being here. And it's up to you to keep the stories going. Remember that. It's also a good time to say hello to our tribal council that are here today. And uh, for those of you tribal council members that are here, could you just wave your hand and say hello? Because with their support, uh, we're here at this point. Yeah. 
Coco River. We're teaching our young people, we're listening to our elders, and we're so very blessed as the piece that you have given us as well. And uh, in our pot lives tradition, I would uh, just like to see if I could get some help from you, maybe. Linda, would you help me? Pot lives tradition, we would like to honor all in front of all of you, our tribal elders, our tribal members, and our community, and we would like to We would like to honor Bobby tonight. Uh, we uh, have a new logo blanket uh, that was just, uh, just made uh, for special honorings of people that has been a big, big part of our history of our community. We take every opportunity to recognize Bobby Hall and to thank her and to tell her she's a part of our community and that uh, we're so very blessed to have at her support as during restoration. I'm not sure where we're going at. 